You're watching Economics Amplified, the latest thinking on the biggest issues from UChicago's Becker Friedman Institute. Well, it's a distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today. He's uh, a former colleague, a friend, and somebody who I've learned a lot from about various aspects of economics. He's now a professor at Columbia University. His contributions range over a wide area. Uh, I'll just mention a few. I'm not going to go into all his accomplishments because we wouldn't have any time for the presentation and for the discussion. But he's known for work on how, let's say, if you have two or more members of an organization, how they make the uh, collective choice together, like a husband and a wife. So that's really been very influential work given the fact that uh, there's often conflict between, um, let's say, a husband and a wife and what they should be doing. How do they reach a decision? He's also worked a lot on m the issue of who sorts with who in, in marriage, like who marries whom, by education, by many other characteristics, and from the theory uh, on insurance problems, the role of private information, self-selection, and the like. Uh, his contributions are ranged over a deep theory, applied theory, and, and, and very uh, empirical and quantitative. So it's a wide range. It's in the Chicago spirit of combining theory and empirical work, which describes a lot of his work. So without further ado, I'll get, give our speaker, uh, Professor Kiyopori. Thank you. Well, I'm gonna... oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, can everybody hear me? Uh, it's, uh, it's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Usually, I've seen the list of people who spoke at the Friedman Forum, and it's quite impressive. Usually, they have something in common. They speak about uh, their own work or topics which are related to their own work. And I'm not following this tradition because uh, Gary mentioned that I've been working in various fields, but essentially, macro is not one of them. And still, I'm going to talk mostly about macro issues. But I'm following another old Chicago tradition, which is that you're not mostly a macroeconomist or a microeconomist or an econometrician. You're mostly an economist. And as an economist, you should be interested in and willing to talk about any kind of topic that, that's related to economics, provided that it's important. And I don't think there are many topics which are uh, more important than the one I'm going to talk about today. So the caveat here is I'm not talking on a topic on which I've been working for the last 15, uh, 15 years. That's the, but in a sense, what I'm going to do is I will give you some facts which are uncontroversial. I'm going to give you some ideas or some concepts which I think are commonsensical, and then we can start discussing. The reason why I, I started with this, uh, with this topic is a sense of frustration. Uh, what, when people talk a lot about the Euro crisis, and when you read the newspapers, especially the European newspapers, or when you hear uh, not only journalists, but also politicians and other people, there are two kind of claims that emerge. And I think most of them are, uh, two of them, the two of them actually are, are highly debatable. Uh, the first claim is that the euro problem, is the euro crisis is essentially a debt problem, which means that if we can solve the debt issue, we're done. We're fine and, and everything is, is, uh, is okay. And the second claim, which you see a lot of those days, is the worst of the crisis is behind us. You know, there are, we've been some very rough times, uh, but now we are, we are beginning to see the light. And uh, to be frank, I disagree with both claims. I think that the worst of the crisis is probably not behind us, but ahead of us, uh, that there is at least a lot of suffering yet to come. And I think that the crisis is not certainly not exclusively, and I will try to argue not mostly a debt crisis, that in a sense the debt is as much of a symptom as it is a cause, and there are some deeper causes which are behind the current situation in Europe. Fine, let me start with an, uh, an anecdote, and the anecdote is, is linked with this place, not this building, because the building did not exist at that time, but this university and this department. Uh, so we're back in 1999, before the, the introduction of the euro, and uh, Jacques Delors came for a lunch uh, with the um, 
the department, with economists from the Department of Economics at the University of Chicago. Actually, uh, you may not remember who the Delors is, but Delors used to be the finance minister of the French government when uh, Mitterrand was president, and then he became the head of the commission, which is the executive, main executive body of the European Union, and he was probably the most influential person in the move toward the Euro. He was coming to, uh, to the US, he came to Chicago, and he explicitly asked to uh, meet with economists from the University of Chicago. Uh, so there was this lunch, and there was 10 people across uh, around the table. Um, Jacques Delors was there, of course. And then, you know, Gary was there, Bob Fogel was there, uh, Mert, Mert Miller, if I remember well, uh, Bob Lucas, you know, uh, all of them. Uh, Nobel laureate or future Nobel laureate. Uh, and I was there as French. I mean, I was in a different category, but since I was the only French professor in the department, I was supposed to, uh, to show up during this, uh, during this lunch. It was a very interesting lunch. So it started Chicago style. I think, if I remember well, Bob Fogel, uh, starting by saying, Mr. President, do you realize that in history, we don't have a single example of a monetary union that survives as such. There are two scenarios. Either it merges into a fiscal union and then a political union, and you end up with a federal state, or it explodes. And you have plenty of examples of both, uh, of both uh, kind of paths. Why is that? Well, we're going to discuss this a bit more precisely. I will, I will, I will give you a, a few, a few um, uh, remarks on this. but. Essentially, uh, an exchange rate is a relative price. And as such, it's a crucial element of flexibility for the system. Now, what the monetary union does is freezing a relative price. Everyone who has done some price theory knows that freezing a relative price is dangerous. Now, in this particular case, the kind of prediction made by Gary, Bob Fogel, Bob Lucas, and the others was you have a bunch of countries, assume that those countries experience divergent microeconomic evolutions, then there will be tensions. And because this tension cannot be adjusted by an adjustment of relative price, what we call a devaluation, a change in the exchange rate, if this kind of, uh, of uh, element of flexibility does not exist, the tension will accumulate and at some point they might become unbearable. I'm going to discuss this a little bit, trying to understand what, you know, what, what are the, the, the basic notion behind this. But what's very interesting was, uh, the, the, the answer by Delors. And Delors said, Professor, what we, what would you just say is right? And we know it. We fully realize that the monetary union as such is not sustainable in the long run. But what you must understand is this is just a first step. This is a first step on the path toward fiscal unification and then political unification. And in a sense, he did not say exactly this, but he sort of conveyed uh, this, this impression. The monetary union is a way of burning new vessels. Once you've done that, you cannot come back. You need to move toward political, political unification and something like this. Now, keep that in mind, uh, because we did the monetary union. I'm not completely sure that we move very far in the direction of the fiscal union uh, or in the direction of the political union, but there was this idea right from the beginning that that was the goal, and in a sense, the monetary union made sense only as a first step in this direction. Fine. Let me start briefly uh, with this notion that uh, monetary union are, are dangerous because you're freezing relative exchange rate. That, that does not mean that you cannot think of a successful monetary union. By the way, do you, could you guys think of one successful monetary union? If I ask you an example of a success, successful monetary union, what kind of example would you come with? Huh? Well, yeah, this country, yeah, United States. Uh, think of the United States. United States, in terms of size, in terms of population, in terms of GDP, it's not smaller than the Eurozone. Actually, in terms of size, uh, geographical size is much bigger. Uh, at some point in history, there were several currencies coexisting. 
actually as as uh, as uh, late as uh, right during the secession war there were several currencies coexisting within the, within this country uh still it's a monetary union you do have regions that ex that are experiencing completely divergent evolution think of the the Midwest, not Chicago, but uh, Cleveland, Detroit, you know, Ohio, Michigan. Those places which were, which were the heart of the steel industry, of the car industry, which were booming in the, in the 50s, 60s, and then were very severely hit in the, in the following decades. On the other hand, you have states which have been booming during the, during the, late, uh, the, the recent decades uh, in the Southwest and so on. So we have been those kind of very sharply contrasted evolutions uh, economic evolution, macroeconomic evolution between the regions, but we did not see a devaluation of the Michigan dollar vis-a-vis -vis the Texas dollar. We still have the same currency. So what is it that allows the system to absorb those shocks without the help of the uh, of a devaluation? Now, this is a complex analysis. It was started by uh, Mundell, actually, here in Chicago uh, years ago. Uh, I'm not, not going to lecture uh, you on this, uh, in, 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 if only because I'm not, I'm not competent. But let me give you two things which are very important. The first one is fiscal unification. A very large fraction of government expenditure, of public expenditures in this country are decided and implemented at the federal level. This implicitly means that there will be huge transfers across regions. When a country is in recession, Income, individual income go down. So the amount that's paid uh, uh, as under the form of income tax goes down. Profits are down, which means that the amount collected as corporate taxation is, is, uh, is lower. Whereas in the, in the booming part, you got the opposite. In addition, you got all the, the social welfare program, which are partly or totally in some cases funded by the federal level, and that's the opposite. Uh, if you think of food stamps or, or, uh, or unemployment insurance, or all those kind of uh, mechanism, uh, by which to, to which the federal government contributes, uh, well, in those places which are hit by the recession, they receive a lot. The places which are booming receive much less. If you look at it carefully, you realize that they are very important transfer. We're talking ten or hundreds of billions across, across regions over time. Those transfers are not visible. It's not that the governor of Texas is signing a check to the governor of Michigan. It's not that you have the kind of uh, drama that you see a lot in Europe, in which European people sit and decide whether to, to, uh, to give 200 uh, billion uh, euros to Greece, and, uh, and uh, there, uh, there is a lot of political tension, and the German electors are very reluctant to the idea that we're going to bail out those lazy Greek people, and Greek people are, are mad at the, at the, at the Germans who, who don't want to with a month to, uh, to help them, and so on and so forth. You don't have this, because essentially the transfer are not even seen. You really need to look for them. But they are there, they are the big time, and they play a huge role. Incidentally, this also means that there is a lot of coordination between the policies. When the federal government implements a stimulus, for instance, we may discuss whether or not it's a good idea, but if you implement a stimulus, you implement a stimulus in all of the US at the same time, which means that de facto there is an expansionary policy in all those, those, those states and it's as if the, 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 the economic, the, the public intervention in those states were largely coordinated. Again, you don't have the kind of drama that I want to do some reliance, uh, policy, but my neighbor is, uh, is, uh, applying a deflationary policy because I'm concerned with growth and he's concerned with, uh, with the deficit, which you see a lot of in Europe. So that's the first thing, fiscal unification. I'm not talking about harmonization, I'm talking about unification. And the second point I want to emphasize is migrations. And I'm talking about internal migrations. Uh, again, this takes place a lot in a country like the United States. If you take a city like Detroit, Detroit lost more than 50% of its inhabitants over the last decades. You cannot think of one city in Europe which has, lo I mean, large city, I mean, not talking about villages, but which has lost even 30% of its population. Now, there has been, you don't see, again, you don't see much of it, because if you look uh, on any given year, and if you look in the state, the percentage of the workforce that the flow of people moving 
to the state from, from outside the US uh, as compared to the total stock uh, of the workforce, it's, it's small, it's two, three uh, percent. But when you, oops. But when you accumulate this over, over, over a decade, uh, it, it, it adds up to, a, to, to large movements. Actually, uh, a student at Columbia uh, wrote his dissertation about the, an old question, which is what's the impact of immigration? Not internal immigration, but immigration from the outside, from Mexico in, that, in his case, over local wages. And now, that's an old problem, but he had new data, and he could, he could address it in a, in a kind of new way. Uh, what he used is a, a natural experiment, there are, a, a, an economic crisis in Mexico that increases a lot the, the, uh, the migration from Mexico to the U.S. Now, those migrations go to very specific places. So you can ask yourself, if I look at those places to which migration is, is, is a major phenomenon, what do I see, for instance, for, on local wages, for uh, unskilled people. What he finds was the following. If you look at the very short term, six months, you see a big effect. So there is a very significant impact. But if you look, if you wait for two years, this impact is washed out, or I should, I should say spread out over the country just because the internal migration adapt. For instance, typically there will be less people moving to this particular place from other states. So the role of migration, of internal migrations, to, to sort of uh, compensate the kind of, uh, of the divergences and divergent shock that, that take place is completely crucial. We have internal migration in Europe, but it's much more difficult. Language is an obvious factor. It's not so easy if you're a, if you're a, a Spanish lawyer to go and, and work in, uh, in Germany. Uh, the, the lack of coordination between social securities system across uh, countries, I mean, all kind of, of problem makes it much, much more difficult to, to move between across countries than, than it is, uh, to move across states in the, in the United States. Okay. So that's a, a and by the way, when, when Delors said, the, the crucial thing will be, uh, fiscal unification and then political unification, that more or less what he had in mind. Fine. Now, let's talk about Europe. Uh, I was saying, the, the, actually, I was not saying, Gary, Bob, and, uh, and, uh, and friends were saying the, the one thing we're concerned with are divergent macro evolutions, because then the tension will become very, very, very hard to, uh, to, uh, to manage. And uh, so what, what are the divergent evolution? Well, look at this. Those are unit labor costs. Relative to Germany. So Germany is flat here as 100. And we start by normalizing everything to 195. Note that this is before the euro, right? And those, those, those numbers come from the European Commission. So what you see up there, you got uh, Ireland. This is Italy. Uh, the green one is Greece. Uh, this is Portugal. Uh, you got Spain here. Uh, and so, I mean, the name of the countries up there sound quite familiar, right? Uh, those are exactly the country we read about in the newspaper when we talk about the euro crisis. First of all, this divergence predates the euro. It's not that the euro caused this divergence. Of course, if you look at what's going on before, if you look between 95 and 2000, you see that the, the unit labor cost in Italy went up 30% vis-a-vis Germany. But this could be fixed by devaluation. Remember, the exchange rate between the Italian lira and, uh, and the German the Deutschmark is just something like the price of one hour of work of the Italian worker uh, relative to the same hour of work by, by, by a German worker. So if you devaluate, you, you, you can essentially compensate this. And this is really decided that, that exchange rate is a relative price that allows you to, to essentially adjust the market. So there was a lot of this, and actually the, the rates that were implicit in the, in the, when, when the euro, the, you know, the exchange rate to the euro in 2000 were taking that into account. But look at what happened since then. Now, this is, this is starting in 2000. The, 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 the unit cost in, in Germany increased, but not much. Look up there. You got Greece. You got, uh, you got Portugal. You got Spain. You got Italy. And unfortunately, you have France as well. Now, if you look at this, you have something like 20 to 30 percent, uh, deviation. And now you don't have the, uh, devaluation as a way of fixing this. 
So in terms of competitiveness, those countries have been facing a huge shock. I think that's probably the, the most important problem that the euro is facing now. And it's a problem, it's not, a, it's, it's, it's not, it's not bad luck. It was quite clear right from the beginning as it was pointed out by the U of C economist in, uh, in this lunch in 1999 that the spirit of the euro, the spirit of a monetary union, the spirit of freezing exchange rates will mean that this kind of, uh, of discrepancy will be much harder to compensate. Now in practice, what can you do to, uh, solve this kind of situation, to solve this lack of com By the way, how do you, what, what are the, 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 the empirical consequences of this? Slow growth. Obviously, the, when you lose competitiveness, it means that you're, you, you have, a, you have a hard time exporting. Uh, and it, in particular, if you're in a situation in which on the, uh, on, on the internal side, you cannot, uh, you're, you're, you have, you have to, um, you have to adopt a deflationary policy because you want to, you want the budget to uh, to have a surplus, you're, you're, so you will re reduce public expenditures or increase taxes or both, which is pretty much was what uh, European government have been doing. So internal demand is uh, will not be the main the main engine for growth, and this means that export will not be the main engine for growth, just because you you have the burden of this lack of competitiveness. So what can you do? Well, you need to. Re decrease the, the cost of labor, which means that, unfortunately, it seems that uh, one solution, which seems to be the path on which we are now, is that those countries, Italy, Spain, France, will have to, Greece, will have to deflate their way back to competitiveness. We need a recession and a level of employment large enough for wages to go down uh, and to go down in real terms. Now, of course, when we, with an inflation which is basically zero, going down to uh, in, in real terms means dec uh, decreasing in nominal terms, and that that's hard to achieve. But that that's the kind of thing that will be needed. Now, the question is, how severe a recession do you need? Let me come back to the previous graph, and I would like to contrast two countries which I find very interesting. Uh, one is Spain. Spain is here. So it's this. So you've seen it has been increasing a lot. Here we're really at the, at the, at the, in a, in a tough moment that the, the crisis is, is, is starting to, uh, to settle in and, and we have lots of employment start growing and so on. Wages have been going down, but not by much. Uh, and if you look at Italy, where is Italy up there? Actually, they have, they have not been going down at all. Compare that with Ireland. Ireland had the same kind of problem, very high wages, but they went down quite a lot. It's not that unemployment was much higher in Ireland than it was in Spain. Actually, Spain, as, as, as you know, is, is the, the unemployment is 25%. But the labor market is completely different across those countries. The labor market in Ireland is much more flexible. What characteristic of the labor market in countries like, like France, like Italy, like Spain, is that it's mostly an insider, outsider market. Essentially, you got two types of, uh, of population in the working force. You have people who have a normal contract. What, what in the US will be a standard labor contract in the sense that you cannot be fired without severance payments. And actually those contracts are actually much more uh, protective than the US contract. It's much harder to fire people in France or especially in Spain than it is in, uh, in the US. Uh, for instance, you need in France, if you want to fire someone, you need Technically, the authorization of a judge, uh, or things like this, and the, the thing going to go to court and things like this. So those people are extremely protected. On the other hand, you got the subpopulation, the, the so-called outsiders, who don't have a contract like this. They have a, an explicitly short-term contract. So they have a, 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 a work contract for one year, and after one year, the contract is, is over, they lose their job, and they cannot even uh, ask for severance payments. Uh, just the termination of the country. Now, when there is unemployment, of course, the second type of people suffer a lot. The first time, the first type of people are mostly protected. There is unemployment among them, but the, the probability that, that those people would, would get unemployed is actually quite low. But the second type of people are hit really fully by the problems. 
Now, with this explain why the unemployment rate in Spain is 25%, but if you look at the unemployment rate of young people, it's more than 50%. If you look at unemployment rate, even in France, which is not the, in which the, the labor laws are not as extreme as in Spain, but if you look at the unemployment rate of young people who are unskilled, again, it's more than 50%. An unemployment rate of 50% is very hard to imagine. You have to be careful, of course, because uh, in Spain, for instance, one thing is there is there is an informal economy. So there are people who are officially unemployed, who de facto are, are working those kind of you know small jobs. But it's not that the people, all the unemployed uh, people, are technically not working at all. And also, there are plenty of social mechanisms. Well, the safety net, of course, there is a safety net in uh, in Western countries. Plus, the family is playing is playing a role in in terms of you know trying to smooth the shocks, for instance, what you see a lot in Spain and in Italy are people aged 25 to 30, uh, instead of living by themselves, they're living with their family. Well, that's, you know, part of the, the family which is there to, to smooth the shock. But still, so what you, what you have here is uh, the, the kind of deflation that you need to come back to competitiveness can be very hard in countries in which we have this duality of the labor market, essentially because the people who have tenure, they're not that much affected by the, by the unemployment rate, and they're not that much willing to decrease their wage because the unemployment rate is, is large outside. And I think there is a lot of this going on here. So, what can we do? And first of all, what can the European Central Bank do? Because those arguments, you know, you hear a lot about the, the crisis behind us, and the usual argument is the European Central Bank is there, and the, the European Central Bank is going to flood the whole stuff with money, and so we will be safe. Uh, there, is, there is that much that the European Central Bank can do. Uh, first of all, at the end of the day, funding government deficits uh, by printing money is somewhat scary. Uh, we have some kind of... Uh, uh, Horror stories in the in the past, uh, but you know, the European Central Bank can probably alleviate the debt problem, and actually does alleviate the debt problem at least in the short run. So definitely, the European Central Bank can buy time, but this is not something that the European Central Bank can address. Restoring competitiveness. What you would need is something like you know, a lot of inflation in Germany and no inflation in uh, in Spain and Italy. For a 5%, uh, 6% inflation in Germany and 0% inflation in Spain, Italy, and France for the next, uh, for the next five or six years. And, you know, even the central bank cannot achieve something like this. What we need are reforms. And I mean structural reforms. And pretty much we know what kind of reforms I need. Now, let's, let's do some kind of, uh, fiction politics. Let's assume just for a moment that a country like Greece or Portugal is not a member of the European Union. So take exactly a country which has exactly the same symptoms as Greece or Portugal, but outside the European Union. The IMF would intervene, obviously. When you look at the, at the numbers, the, those countries are bankrupt. Uh, actually, Greece already defaulted. Uh, so the IMF would, would and what, what would the IMF do? There will be a standard package, uh, which, you know, the, the, the details of which depends across country, but in general, there will be four components to the package. One thing will be a short-term macro measure, stop the bleeding, which is exactly what has been implemented in terms of what we call austerity. Uh, the, that's not the big word in Europe. Second is structural reforms. I'm going to talk about, in a minute, about the structural reforms that are needed. But there is a kind of large agreement, even in Europe, about what kind of reforms will be needed. Those are painful. The, the austerity measures are painful by definition, and even the structural reform will increase the situation in the medium term, but in the short term, they can be, they can be quite costly. So in general, what the IMF would do is compensate this by two types of measures which are exactly needed to alleviate the pain. One would be uh, a renegotiation of the debt, so essentially default. There is no point uh, carrying the burden of an excessive debt on this path, which will be difficult. And the second one will be a massive devaluation so that you can boost competitiveness. And by boosting competitiveness, uh, you are, you're, uh, you're stimulating exports. And you, the hope is that that will help regaining growth. Uh, but as I said, you cannot devaluate. You could, ex you could hope that the, the euro will go down. 
But that's not too likely because remember the euro is the is also the currency of Germany. And if you look the euro, if you think of the euro as the currency of Germany, it's grossly undervalued. Germany is extremely competitive. Actually, Germany has, has a huge surplus. On the other hand, the euro, as if you see the euro as the currency of Italy, it's vastly overvalued. What you really need would be an adjustment within the eurozone, which is exactly what you cannot do with the euro. Let me come briefly. I don't want to talk too much. Uh, what kind of reforms will be needed? First of all, reform of the labor market. I think that's absolutely crucial. Uh, that has started in Spain. That that might be starting in Italy, not in France. There has been something which has been called a reform that doesn't go uh, far enough. But you want to increase flexibility of the of the labor market, and in particular, if you could limit this kind of discrepancy between the insider and the outsiders, that would boost the economy as a whole. Second thing is reform of public finances. Uh, there are two aspects of this. One is uh, uh, efficiency. The technology to collect taxes is a complex technology, and some countries are much better than others. If you look at the tax collection in countries like Italy, or even worse, Greece, you realize that there is a huge fraction of the economic activity which, is, which essentially escape taxes. And, you know, this can be improved. And, I, and they're on the way. Believe me, I, was, I spent one week in Greece this summer. People, the, the tax collectors, are starting to, to be tough and are starting to do things about this. Another aspect is the amount of public expenditures. If you take France, the, um, the tax collection uh, technology is quite good in France. Unfortunately, would say some people, but, but it, it works quite well. But if you look at the amount of expenditures, uh, public expenditures in France have reached 57% of GDP. Oops. Well, I don't need that. Um, that's absolutely, well, it's, it's a complex numbers because it includes public expenditures, you know, spending on public goods, but also transfers and so on and so forth. But 57. That's a huge amount. That's, that's, uh, probably the, the highest, uh, the highest, it's definitely the highest number in the Eurozone. And it must be one of the highest number in the, in developed countries. Uh, again, that should be fixed and that should not be fixed by increasing taxes, which is what the current government is mostly doing. That should be fixed by decreasing Public, uh, public expenditures and reforming the, the, the government. There is a lot of lot to do there. There, is, there are a lot of, uh, of redundancies, in particular between the various level of administration in the French administration and so on. But you need political courage to do that, and it's quite hard to do. You should increase competition. You should, in particular, the the, the European Union. I'm not talking about monetary unification. I'm just uh, talking about the initial idea, which was creating the free uh, a free trade zone was immensely successful. If you look at the impact on trade, on growth and everything, that, that was extremely successful. But it didn't go far enough. For instance, uh, the market for commodities is largely unified, much less uh, is the market for services. There, there are things to do there. You should cut the red tape, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, in a sense, the, a, a former prime minister of Luxembourg used to say, what we should do, it's not the problem. We all know what we should do. The problem, the one thing what we don't know how to do is being reelected after doing it, or actually being elected after explaining what we what we're going to do. Just because now making reforms is always painful. But making reforms in a situation in which you have a high unemployment and a huge debt and you cannot stimulate the economy because, because you're, uh, you're, you're at the limit of your, of your budget deficit and so on and so forth, that's very, very expensive. Now, in a sense, the monetary union has been technically exactly a hard drug. All the pleasure came first. Greece all of a sudden entered the union and all of a, all of a sudden could borrow at rates which were pretty much the German rates. Wonderful. You know, they had been paying a huge spread because people were sort of concerned, rightly so, about the, the situation of their public finances and so on. And all of a sudden, they have this huge boon. They can, they can, they can borrow at a, at a very low rate. Perfect. Had this money be used to make the kind of structural reform, to invest in, uh, in infrastructure, to invest in, in knowledge, in education, in this kind of stuff, to make the kind of long-term investment, to make the kind of reform that were needed, we would have a success story. And by the way, that's pretty much what you see here. It's what Germany did in 2000, uh, in 2007 with the, with the program introduced by, by Schroeder. I mean, not saying that it's the ideal, it was the ideal thing to do, but there was this willingness to 
change things to make the kind of reform. And in that, it was the right moment, that the situation was was sort of not too terrible and it, it was politically feasible. He still lost his job, I know, but but he did it. Um, but in the case of the um, in the case of the monetary union, if you don't do that, like in any hard drug, the pleasure comes first, but then it's only pain. Then you're in a situation in which the, the monetary the, the monetary union is essentially uh, something that prevents you from devaluating, which would be really something helpful in that situation, plus constraints in terms of budget deficit and so on and so forth. And it's not so clear what the benefits are. Now, there are benefits in terms of the, the rate at which you borrow, of course. Uh, let me just conclude in two minutes about what what uh, what scenario do I see for the future, and then we can we can discuss three scenarios. Let me mention three of them. And you know, it's it's about it's about uh, everyone's creativity. So some people come with five, some people come with two. But let me let me start with three scenarios. One is the rosy scenario. We move in the direction of fiscal unification and political unification, and in the end. Uh, a federal government. Which means that we're creating the mechanism that work in the US and that allow the economy to adjust despite the fact that you cannot change the exchange rate. The, the, the kind of stuff we discussed before. Uh, internal migration. We are trying to facilitate this, but there are some, there are strong limits. Uh, mostly fiscal unions and things like this. Now, just uh, give, let me give you a number about this. If you look at the budget of the European Commission, so the part, you, you know, I was referring to the fact that if you look at, at uh, government expenditures in the US, a large fraction of these are federal expenditures. The equivalent would be, let's look at the fraction of expenditures, public expenditure decided at the European level, as opposed to the one which are, which are decided at the local level, at the uh, country level. It's tiny. Uh, public, the, 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 the budget of the commission, uh, including agricultural aid and everything is, is two or three percent of total GDP. It, it, uh, any, any sense of federalism and, and, money and fiscal union would mean multiplying this number by a factor of at least 10. No one is willing, really willing to do that. It means abandoning sovereignty and people are resisting this. So, this idea, which, which, which was actually the initial idea, that, which, that, that's the reason why I, I, I vividly remember this, this, this response by Jacques Delors. That was the original idea of the people. We're going to move towards fiscal union and then we're going to move towards political unification and in the end we will be the US, more or less. We did not do that. We did not do that when it was sort of easier to do that. There was the momentum and the, uh, and, uh, and the monetary union had a lot of benefits in terms of cost for, for southern countries and so on. We didn't take this opportunity. My personal feeling is that now, if anything, we're further away from this than we were 15 years ago. People hate each other. You go to Greece, it's the, the level of anti-German feeling in Greece is completely amazing. And I think it's, the situation is much worse than it used to be. So the rosy scenario is not impossible. I would not consider it as very likely. The second scenario is the catastrophe, is the explosion of the Eurozone. What form could take this explosion? I don't believe that much in, uh, in an exit, in one country exiting. Uh, yeah, at some point uh, at the peak of the Greek crisis, people were talking about the Grexit, which would be Greece just leaving the Euro. Problem is, if you're a heavily indebted country, leaving the euro is extremely costly. Because, uh, of course, you can then, then you can default on your debt, but you know, the Greece defaulted on its debt even within the euro. On the other hand, you're out of a mechanism that guarantees some, some access to credit at, at reasonable rates. Uh, you might, uh, the, the consequence might be that you will be unable to borrow or the next five or of 10 years, or, or the rate will, will, will st start skyrocketing and the economic cost would probably be huge. So I don't believe that will happen. Something that might happen would be a split of the European Union between two subzones, essentially Germany and, 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 and small France on one hand and Southern Europe on the other hand. That could be possible. If you look at the cost, it's absolutely huge. Just let me give one example. 
you're a German bank. Most of your liabilities are in Germany because it's their deposits from your depositors and your depositors are German. But your assets are spread all over the world. In particular, you have a lot of assets in Italy, in Spain, and so on. Now assume that the euro splits into a strong uh, northern euro and southern euro, and of course, it, it makes sense only if the southern euro devaluates 30% vis-a-vis northern euro. Now, if you do that, all of a sudden, if you, if you take my German banks, the liability are still in the strong currency, but a significant fraction of the assets are in the weak currency, which means that a significant fraction of your asset have been have lost overnight 30% of their value. That's much more than the current capital of the bank. So the bank is the, the bank is technically bankrupt, and you the government has to bail out. And basically, you have to bail out all the banking system. I mean, so the cost would be absolutely tremendous. And again, I hope it will not happen, but uh, it's it's not completely impossible. And the third scenario, which is somewhere in between, will be we continue limping. We continue on a path in which uh, we, we painfully try to restore productivity. There is a lot of unemployment. There is a very slow growth in the, in the South European countries. Uh, and there is this very painful process of uh, wage, incre- wage decrease, or at least a uh, very slow rate of wage increase, slow growth, reduction of public expenditures, possibly some, some structural reforms, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, the problem is how likely is this kind of scenario? It all depends on one thing on which I'm completely incompetent, which is a political question. To what extent can a democratic system survive in a situation like this? How long can can a democratic, democratically elected government impose the type of recession that is likely to be needed to get this? If you think of Greece, Greece has had a decrease in GDP, a recession of more, of, of a very significant one, four or five percent for several years. Well, the consequence is there is this uh, neo-Nazi movement, the Golden Dawn, which is attracting a lot of vote. And we see a lot of this in Europe. We see extremes on the left and on the right, extracting vote. You see more and more people saying we should, uh, the hell with the union, we should get out of the union and so on. So what, what's the political stability? Of a, uh, of, democ- of a democratic government in a in situation of, of stress and of duress of the kind that, that we have in mind, that's a big unknown. So in the end, I'm not very optimistic, but I'm trying to be, you know, as realistic as possible. I'm done with my presentation and, and I'm welcoming your questions. You talk about structural reforms in the labor market, particularly reducing the duality. Uh, there's a plethora of paper that show that actually the presence of temporary jobs increase total de- job destruction and unemployment. But when you say that you need to uh, transform the labor market and make it more flexible, it actually means to reduce employment labor protection for the permanent jobs. But if you do that, unless you unless you eliminate all the temporary contracts, you will just have pretty much the same situation, but you just withdraw the benefits for the people that actually have them. So. That, that's a very serious problem. Um, the standard argument would be something like this. If the, the protected jobs are less protected, then employers will be less reluctant to create these kind of jobs. That's something, you know, you talk with, with employers in France, uh, you ask them why, but you know, your, your business is doing reasonably well, why don't you uh, hire new workers? And they, they tend to tell you, you know, hiring, hiring this kind of uh, uh, temporary uh, kind of contract, that's fine. Hiring a, a worker for good, that's, that's a very tough decision because if, the th- if things go, uh, go badly, I will have a hard time getting rid of them. So the, the hope is, if you decrease the cost of, of laying off people, then employers will be reluctant, will be less reluctant to hire this kind of country. Is it wishful thinking? In the long term, I think that that's right. But in the short term, what you're pointing out to something which I think is deeply true, which is it will be extremely costly. A reform like this, in the short term, we, sh- we should see the cost because we should see plenty of layoff. 
you know, people were redundant, but are not laid off for the moment. Uh, and we don't expect to see much on the positive side, so on the hiring side, at least in the short term. Now, this is typically the kind of reform. If you're in a situation in which the economy is well, uh, and the economy, there is growth, you can implement a reform like this, right? Because there is enough growth in, uh, all over in the economy for, for the shock to be absorbed. Uh, the current situation is the worst possible situation to implement this. That's exactly right. On the other hand, you must realize that the political process, as any kind of human activity, you know, I'm an economist, uh, respond to incentives. And the incentives to making painful reform and everything is okay are very weak. Whereas now, there are incentives. And, you know, Spain started, Italy sort of started and might, might go in this direction just because there is this perception that the crisis is so hard. Because, you know, the current situation, a huge cost in terms of inequality. But you've got those people who are excluded from the labor market. It's not that they are unemployed for six months and then they back to, to the labor force. That they have no hope. The probability that, will, that they will find a, a kind of stable job in the next two, three years is, is very small. The, another indicator which is quite interesting is the size of long-term unemployment. And here, you know, essentially, in a dual, in a dual kind of labor market, there is a, a huge difference between, between the, the, there is some short-term uh, unemployment. The long-term unemployment is, is, is swollen by all those people. And the long-term unemployed in, in Europe, but they have always been much higher than in the, in the United States. And it's, it's, it's even worse now. Although the number of long-term unemployed in the United States has been going up too. But. So it's a concern, definitely. Yes, hi. Uh, do you think the situation is any different than that was in the financial crisis in 07? So it seems like going to the ground, you would have the same trend going up in a way without the crisis. Yes, uh, ex except maybe for the... For you the probably repeat the, the question, Pierre-André. Probably yeah. repeat because we couldn't hear the question. Oh, yeah, I was just asking if it would be the same situation without the financial crisis, because even before the financial crisis, the trend has been the, the divergence between the German... Is your question related? Go ahead. He's right. In 2005, Germany implemented wage, gro wage rate growth ceiling, which... which which limited the ability for German uh, companies to grow the rate which they were paying their employees. Effectively, Germany increased uh, their employment in the country at the expense of all of the other countries. And so you see from 2005, there's a clear decrease in the unit cost of labor in Germany as all of the other countries continue to increase. So the unemployment problem in the other countries in the UN, uh, the other countries in the EU, is clearly at the, is at the fault of Germany. And I, I, you know, you, you can talk about it and the responsibility that Germany has to France, Spain, and Greece in your... Wait, 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 wait. You, you, I, I agree with... <laughs> I agree with basically everything what you say, except you don't want to push it and saying you, if you implement a virtuous policy, you're responsible because since the, all, everybody else is, is doing crazy things, they will be much worse off. You know, you, I, I, to, to answer both questions, basic, uh, obviously my presentation was biased and I overdid it big time. I did not talk at all about the financial crisis. So essentially I might have given the impression that, you know, financial crisis is not the issue. That's not true. Obviously, the financial crisis was a huge shock, and uh, and uh, and in particular, the debt problem. We all know that the debt problem uh, was was amplified by. I think the the roots of the debt problem were already there, but it was obviously amplified by the um, by the crisis. But my point is, in a sense, my my presentation was biased in that way, very willingly, because I want to sort of counter the standard presentation which is, which you see a lot of in Europe, which is everything is due to the financial crisis, which means the U.S., right? The U.S. people, they have been those crazy, they have done this crazy thing with their banks, and as a result, there's been a financial crisis. And uh, if it were not for the financial crisis, we would be happy in a, in a wonderful world and so on. And you see a lot, especially on the left, in uh, for the parties on the left that tend, tend to, to have this. Uh, there has been a financial crisis. The financial crisis has a very a huge negative impact. If you look at Ireland, for instance, the story, the story of Ireland, uh, you know, all of a sudden the government decides, which was sort of a very strange decision, but decides to be responsible for the liability of the banks and the liability of the banks were huge, even when compared to the, the GDP of the country. And, and of course that, that, that had a huge impact on the situation of Ireland. So I'm not saying 
that the financial crisis is uh, uh, had no role, that, that would be completely stupid. But you still write in the following. One thing I do believe is that the roots for the problems were initially in the situation, in, in the creation of the euro, which is the reason why I started with this uh, 1999 lunch. There was a prediction, and you know that's a nice story after all. There was a prediction made by Chicago economists 15 years later who realized that they were exactly right. Uh, of course, they did not predict the, the crisis and so on, but there was this idea that the, the, the European Union has a cost, and you should be very careful about what this cost is, what kind of mechanism do we have to alleviate it and to compensate it. And in a sense, we were lost in the momentum. There was this kind of wave of wishful thinking that we're moving in the right direction and so on and so forth. And people didn't spend enough time working out explicitly what, what the implications were. So in that sense, I think the financial crisis did play a role, but the roots of the crisis were already in the definition of the euro. Now, the, the financial, just to add one thing, the financial crisis played a huge role, in particular in the feelings that you see among, within Europe, about other countries. Those kind of very strong feeling, adversarial, uh, adversarial feeling with respect to the other countries, uh, that's something that has been obviously boosted by the financial crisis. Oh. Uh, welcome you and also what is the question which I think the students that we teach um, ought to be asking? And that is when you're talking about the politics of insiders and outsiders in Europe, can you speak to the, the demographic overhang? Because it is a very much an older population with political sway, and the outsiders tend to be the, edu the, the youth. Um, and and there's, so there's two, outs two, two types of outsiders. There's the Tunisian and Algerian, the, you know, in recent migrants into Europe, or maybe even three generations of uh, disenfranchised or uh, foreigners in, in various parts of Europe. But there's also this idea that if your parent is a long-term worker, there are no openings for the younger. Even though in the U.S. you've seen a lot of turnover and complaints by a very powerful lobby, AARP in the U.S., of, of the elderly that, that there's ageist hiring policies and that workers with, with skills that are not appropriate now is technology changing are being shoved out the door in favor of youth employment. That's not happening in Europe, right? Well, you're exactly right. Uh, I didn't. I did not insist on this point, but but maybe I should have. This idea of first of all, you're exactly right that the insiders mostly are young people. Typical insider is I, I'm I'm showing up on the job market. Uh, now, of course, if I have if I have a, a, a BA from a prestigious institution, things are likely to be good for me. But if I'm unskilled, I just have you know I, I finished I finished high school. Even worse, I'm unskilled and I'm coming from an immigrant background, which is, you know, the, the addition of those, those two, uh, uh, of those two handicaps. Then things are very, uh, the, the prospects are very green for me. Now, one thing I think that, that's extremely important in what you say is that it's not so, it's not only the cost today. Those costs are gonna continue on the long run. Because think in terms of investment in human capital. We have, a generation, we have courts after courts, young people, a significant fraction of whom are not investing in human capital, are depreciating their human capital. And those are, and, and you all know the demographic situation in Europe, so we don't have enough young people. If in that we cannot afford to have, in addition, a decrease in the human capital of a large fraction of those young courts. But that's exactly what's going on. Now again, this pushes you to, to exactly the same question as, to what extent is it politically sustainable? At what point? You know, it, it, I'm very concerned with numbers like a 50% uh, unemployment among young, young people in, in Spain. And you know, in, in some places in Italy, uh, in France, it's, it's pretty much the same. Uh, again, this has to be taken with a pinch of salt, but still, the long term, it's not only the current cost of those people being unemployed, but the long term cost in terms of every, all the dynamics that go with, with being in the labor market are jeopardized by this kind of situation. 
Mr. Andre? Yes. Uh, let, let me come back to your discussion at the end about whether it pays for a country like Greece to leave the Euro. Um, now you mentioned some of the costs, and there obviously are going to be costs, but otherwise, wouldn't Greece, isn't Greece going to be condemned to a long period of high unemployment, low human capital investment, low growth, and so on? Because I mean, given all you said, I mean, that they're not going to move to Germany. I mean, some of them will move. They're not going to move to Germany. Likely, you're going to get this fiscal integration. It's probably less now than in 1999. So, I mean, as I do the calculation for a country like Greece, I say, well, yeah, it's costly in the short run, but the benefits in the long run are, are substantial. Why shouldn't they just leave? and accept some of the costs and gain the advantages of being able to be valued? It's a very difficult question. It's a question that, that, uh, that has been uh, discussed a lot, uh, like two or three years ago. My stand on this, again, I'm not a specialist, right? But my stand on this would be the following. There is a, I can think of a scenario in which an exit would make sense, and that will be the following scenario. You exit, you default on your debt, you devaluate by 30%. You have this huge cost because all, all of a sudden all your import, the price of the cost of your import has increased by 30%. You cannot, you cannot get external funding and so on and so forth. So all of a sudden you got a huge uh, shock to your, to your GDP. The GDP decreased by 25%. But at that moment, you implement the kind of structural reform that are needed. The problem is Greece is a deeply functional country and was before and is still now. Now, if they could, if they could, at the same time, implement the kind of structural reform that will allow them to hope for a balanced and, and healthy growth, then that could make sense. The problem is I doubt very much the, the ability of Greek politicians to do that. And what I have in mind is really the, 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 the Argentinian example. In a sense, they did that. They defaulted on the debt. Devaluation was not a problem. They didn't have this fixed cost because they, they the money, well, there was the peg, they decided not to maintain the peg, but it was not a formal, uh, a formal uh, it was not a exiting uh, uh, a monetary union or anything. Plus, they were extremely lucky because uh, when they did that, you know, during the following years, the price of, of raw material went up big time. They are big exporters, so they had a boom. Still, they didn't do the kind of reform that they should have done. And now I'm very pessimistic about the next future of Argentina because they, 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 the, the, the problem continued to accumulate. Uh, and the, the kind of short period of growth was not exploited to do a kind of, the kind of reform they should have done. And now they're, they're the, I think their, their future prospects are again quite, quite in the black. So that's exactly what I, I would be afraid of in the case of Greece. They, if they go out and, and, and they have this kind of very courageous policy could make sense. But you know, if they were able to have this kind of courageous policy, they would have, they could do that within the euro as well. I think the main problem of Greece is that uh, they have a hard time implementing this kind of policy for plenty of reasons which are linked to the, the internal political process of Greece. Maybe this will move, by the way. But then if, if, if this can move, maybe they can do that within the euro. But, you know, the upside is they're receiving massive subsidies. De facto, they defaulted on the debt. Uh, well, okay, they, they cannot devaluate, but they receive, they receive subsidies. Uh, whether the, the benefit of devaluation I don't know. I think the main, at least the main problem is, I think, in case of Greece, is a, is a political problem. Now there is a political question, which is what's the, the best situation, what's the situation which is more likely to, in, to trigger the kind of reforms that we, that are needed. And again, this I don't know. So if you compare Argentina with Greece, what is the uh, rather than a courageous move for Greece, it would be suicidal because you see that Argentina is a big country that produces that produces many things, whereas Greece actually depends on imports and it imports pretty much everything. So the J curve for Greece would just shoot at the stellar levels. Yeah, there isn't. Yeah, you're right. Uh, a, a, a problem with specific for Greece is that it's not so much. It's it's not obvious that the devaluation would help them that much. It's not that they are producing stuff that will all of, or, or that will uh, overnight become more competitive. So the the benefits of devaluations are probably smaller for Greece than uh, than, than than for other countries. All right, that's right. 
Because it seems like we already have a sort of fiscal union in the sense that you have transfers from Germany to Greece. Yeah, but the the transfers, yeah, that's right. Uh, except that the transfers they are small, and they are incredibly problematic each time. It's a big stuff. There are negotiations. They spend hours. They insult themselves, and they come out with with small transfers. Now, one thing that you guys should read is uh, Tom Sargent's novel lecture. But it's exactly this about the U.S. So first of all, the U.S., what's interesting is that the U.S. did it in exactly the opposite order. It was first a political union, then a fiscal union, and then a monetary union. Which probably is the right, is the, is, is the right order. I'm gonna show you, I, that, that's what Tom, Tom argues, and I think he's right. And in addition, so there is this, uh, uh, one thing that Tom emphasizes is, is uh, there is uh, what he calls a political revolution. There is a, a, a very important moment. Uh, in the, um, in the history of the, in economic history of the United States, and that the move between the Articles of the Confederation in, uh, in 1781 to the Constitution in 88, and one major difference is that, uh, what the Constitution does is that it shifts the power of taxation to a large extent to the federal government. So that's, you know, that's exactly what I meant by, uh, by, by fiscal unions. Uh, now, and, and Tom argues, and I, I think he's, he's absolutely right like this, and he's a specialist on the topic, which I'm not, but he argues that it has been a crucial moment in the economic history of the United States. And that's, that's when, when, when I'm saying now the United States is a, is a fiscal union, that's the outcome of this, uh, this completely crucial move. Uh, now, do we have a, is there any hope in the next future to have this kind of fiscal union in, in, uh, in Europe? Last week, uh, Laurent Fabius came to Colombia. Laurent Fabius is the current French Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, and he was the French Minister of Finance be, uh, before. And uh, I happen to know him quite well because I met him here at Chicago. Just for the record, he was an invited a visiting professor at Chicago at the Harris School for, for two consecutive years, so we were colleagues. So, uh, so he gave a talk about union and so on, and I asked him exactly the question that you asked. You know, what, what are the prospects for, for a future Fiscal union in the, you think that, that there is a, there, there, that there is some hope. And he's a very clever guy. And he very cleverly did not answer my question. He answered a slightly different question, which I did not ask, which is, what are the, the prospects of fiscal harmonization within the Europe? And he said, you know, there are, the prospects are good. We're discussing. We're going to coordinate and so on and so forth. You know, you're pointing out the fact, which I think is very important, that union is completely different. Union means a very large fraction of the expenditures are not decided at the, at the state level, they're decided at the federal level, meaning that there is a huge loss of sovereignty from the state. And these, I don't think the states are willing to accept that. Look look at Germany. It's pretty clear for Germany that they don't want it. But even France, they, would, they, they, they talk about situation in which, but every time there is any more reform that they see as an infringement on, on their uh, on their sovereignty, they overreact. So uh, again, that's that's political fiction. I, I'm not a political scientist, so I don't know, but I'm a bit pessimistic. 